Lionel Schreiber, let's now move on to the second part of our interview and talk about the topic of your Prokhorov Center lecture yesterday, which was on the relationship between literature and freedom of speech. On the face of it, that might seem a strange topic. I mean, literature and the arts are free, are they not? And yet you opted to talk about that particular subject. Why? Uh, because this uh, obsession with social justice in very narrow terms, um, is starting to impinge on what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. And uh, Can you give some examples of that? Um, if I include a non-white character in my work, uh, it gets selected for special scrutiny. Um, so it's often subjected by a certain kind of reviewer to an almost forensic line-by-line -line analysis, looking for stereotypes or um, any other kind of uh, cause for offense. And of course, they always find it, <laughs> um, because that's the nature of the Do project. you respond to that at all when people say to you, look, you're a straight white woman, so you, don't, you haven't had the black experience, whatever that might be. So d d does it worry, does it concern you? How, how do you deal with that. Well, you know, if you're a fiction writer, you haven't had the experience of any of your characters. It is an imaginative exercise. Unless you are writing memoir or autobiography of some sort, you know, or the character you're writing about is just a little avatar for yourself, um, then you are projecting yourselves, yourself into the mind of someone you've made up, um, whose experience you have not had. Uh, to, to a degree, that's a sleight of hand. It's a, there's a skill to it. It's uh, somewhere between uh, magic and lying. <laughs> um, and it's kind of fun. Uh, and yes, it can extend to uh, projecting yourself into someone who has a different race or nationality or Certainly, I do uh, uh, write men all the time. I do lots of male characters, uh, and you can, you know, you can tell me, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't had that experience. Well, fair enough. But all that matters is whether I can get away with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what fiction is about. It is a strange way of looking at things. Otherwise, you know, your only novels could have been the autobiography of Lionel Shriver, uh -huh. part one, part two, part three, and, 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 and so on. It seems to me that there are two aspects here. One is the relationship between the writer and his work, and the other one is what has, what has come to be called cultural appropriation. Let's look at the relationship between the writer and his work first. Uh, isn't it strange that more than one and a half centuries after people conflated the thoughts and ideas and wishes of Emma Bovary on the one hand and Gustave Flaubert, the author of Madame Bovary, the novel, on the other hand, as if Emma's ideas and thoughts were those of Gustave Flaubert. Mm -hmm. That was one and a half centuries ago. And then it took us a while to realize actually what characters are saying is not what the author is mm -hmm. saying or is not necessarily what the author is saying and, and thinking. But now, and this is an example that you gave in your lecture yesterday, you've got a short story about three old men ogling a young woman in a park, and that is then seen as almost like an attack by the writer on a woman. Which uh, the, he, whom the, he made up. <laughs> the, the, the desires of the right. characters are then imputed to the author. Where does that come from? Why is it so hard to see that if you have a novel, I mean, it, the clue is in the word, it's fiction, it's made up. It strikes me as a kind of willful naivete. It's a, it's a deliberate uh, lack of sophistication. Um, and it, it has to do with call-out culture, mm -hmm. right? So in this predatory environment, you're looking for uh, material to hang people with. And um, therefore, if you encounter passages in a piece of fiction that you find offensive, this is a victory, and uh, you've got them dead to rights. Now, it just so happens that in many cases that's going to be in dialogue or it's going to be internal reflection of a character. And no, you can't hang the author on that. 
Um, I, I write a lot of books that take on larger social issues. And in order to do that without being um, preachy or flat, uh, I need to represent more than one viewpoint. So I, uh, you know, my last uh, book, uh, The Mandibles, is, uh, is about a financial collapse in the United States, the fall of the dollar. And therefore, it, uh, a lot of the discussions in the book have to do with uh, economics. And I need people to disagree, you know. So I've got, I've got different, di different viewpoints on what's going on in the book and principles of economics. And uh, that gives the, the book some dimension. It, 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 it puts air in it. And it also means that the, the issue is, is addressed with some complexity from more than one position. And uh, it would be a big mistake to just say, well, this is the viewpoint of the author. And as I um, explained in uh, my address last night, uh, there was a long essay in the New York Review of Books just this summer that decided to pick out uh, a, a viewpoint in my ninth novel, so much for that, of a secondary character is espousing this idea that the whole world divides into mugs and mooches, you know, the, 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 the suckers and the leeches. Um, and she imagined that this explained my whole viewpoint on life and all of my work. It was extremely reductive, not true, and, and weird. I mean, it was a con I believe it was a journalistic convenience. Right? It gave her essay form and uh, it, it gave, gave the piece a, a larger theory. Mm -hmm. It just happened to have been wrongheaded. Yeah. But, you know, that's now much more accepted that you, you can grab something in fiction and claim that this is, what, this is the voice of the author. This is what the author actually thinks. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? I was going to read you a quote from the uh, New York Review of Books. Uh, oh, you looked quote, it up. <laughs> uh, well, the, this one is maybe a different one. The immigration amnesty of 2020 is followed by a constitutional amendment that allows for a foreign-born president, a pudgy, lisping Mexican, just one of the novel's several racist characterizations, unquote. If you read that, well, how do you react to that? One of the things I've seen more frequently recently is reviews that deliberately mischaracterized my work and even on a factual level. For example, the president in The Mandibles does not speak with a lisp, okay? So where'd that come from? Um, and do, do, do you and I that, find do, that... Do you think that the criticism of the of, of, your, of your journalism then mm -hmm. spills over yes, in does. the criticism yes, of your novels? Yes, and that's, I find that most distressing. And it makes me feel um, maybe I made a, a career mistake in writing a lot of uh, comment journalism because it places me politically in a, in a way that potentially alienates not just some of my readership but especially my critics. Mm -hmm. So that um, there's a particular subsection of critics out there who have now labeled me as some kind of um, regressive right-wing weirdo and uh, come at my fiction with prepared hostility. Um, it's a complete misunderstanding of me politically to start, mm -hmm. but it it's also uh, obviously doesn't help the reading of the fiction. And, you know, when you come at a book expecting to hate it, in fact, determined to hate it, it's funny how you, you don't end up liking okay, the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a kind of a surrender to reading books. I actually think there's, there's probably surrender to reading nonfiction books. It's not just exclusive to fiction, but you have to enter into them. You have to give over to the author. You have and, 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 and certainly, especially with fiction, you have to allow yourself to become immersed in another person's world. Um, and, if, and it's very easy to withhold yourself from that experience and to say, 
and to and 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 to look at a text with clinical distance. And if you you know if if that's the way you approach a book, you're you're not going to like it. It's not going to be fun to read. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. feel sorry for these people because the experience of actually of, of reading the book must be so disagreeable, because it's like, oh, oh. yeah, oh oh, yeah. and I, I just what a pity, you know what a. What a waste of time. The, the German philosopher Gadamer says when he, when he talks about reading, he it says it's like playing, but playing is always being played. So it's like being part, you know, you're, you're playing football and you're on, you enter the field and then you do certain things, but then certain things happen to you and you're taken along and so on. And, and that's when you enter a fictional world mm. or the field of fiction, then things happen to you, you're pushed in different directions by different characters and so on. And, and that's the fun of it. Uh, but if you don't allow yourself that that experience, mm -hmm. then obviously you're not going to. You're just outside the field looking. At yeah, it. you're not enjoying the. the you're not the, playing the, the game. The complexity, the fullness of of, of, right. of what the. Novel I mean, is about. Uh, the Washington Post review of uh, of the mandibles. That's what I had thought you were quoting from. Um, he had that thing going on uh, because he had decided that I was politically anathema. And he claimed that uh, that book goes 400 pages without a single joke. Now, <laughs> I have been told over and over again by other readers, so you don't have to de depend just on yesterday, my... No, I was there, just yesterday, one person talking came to came up to that, me yes. and said she just thought it was hilarious. You know, she was laughing aloud all the time. So don't tell me that w that book goes 400 pages without a joke. But I do believe that he read 400 pages without finding anything funny. And, and that's another thing you can withhold, is your sense of humor. You can mm. refuse to find something funny. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's look at the other uh, concept, so not the conflation of the writer and the work that we talked about, but the concept of cultural appropriation, which is something like uh, the use of minority culture elements by the dominant culture, and that is then, so the few goes, that is then uh, a form of exploitation which is a, uh, a continuation of colonialism and imperialism. Mm -hmm. So put like that, it sounds pretty bad, it sounds like something we've got to deal with, but you, it seems to me, are saying the whole idea of cultural appropriation is basically hogwash. Oh, I just think it's silly. Uh, in fact, I've been uh, ambivalent about being associated with this concept because I think that it's so wrong-headed uh, that uh, even if I'm associated with uh, pillorying it, <laughs> it's still contaminating me. Um, first off, the idea of culture being this discrete, definable, fensible thing is ridiculous. After, uh, uh, cultures are a big mush and, and interact uh, quite profitably, I think. Um, I don't think you own your own culture. Um, I don't think you can monetize your own culture. Uh, it came to you, insofar as you can define it at all. It's not something that you personally created, it's something you inherited and something you will pass on. Uh, and it will continue to morph and, and integrate with other cultures, it, it's, a, it's kind of a vague word. It, it's, a, it's a little difficult to pin down even what a culture is. Mm. Uh, it's very hard to understand theoretically as yes. well, because if you look at the 1980s, uh, liberals and, and uh, you know, I consider myself uh, center-left, cent but all you know, postmodernists and so on were writing about the fluidity and, and, and you know, how the, the porous nature of borders and all, and all the rest of it. And now we're back to my culture, your culture. And, and it's all sort of you know, put in different categories and, and all, these, the, all the fluidity and all the changes and all the dynamics seem, seems to have been taken out of, of life. Well, I think uh, one of the things that is powering this concept is that it, it seems to be offering um, people from minority communities, the ability to commodify their experience. That is, you know, you keep writers like me from um, writing about, say, uh, the black experience. And that means there's this um, 
supply and demand situation where you know we've restricted supply <laughs> so you know you're you, now you can you can sell your black experience um, because nobody else gets to write about it and uh, and the price goes up I mean that's the, that's the only thing I have been able to sort out I, maybe I'm betraying the fact that I recently wrote a book about <laughs> economics um, I think that's not uh, understanding how the, at least the book market works. Yeah. Um, it's still strange though, because at the end of the day, to coin a phrase, fiction is words. So you're not mm -hmm. actually appropriating or expropriating or taking actually something. That's like actually. You're, you're writing something about. Right. You're not really taking yes. anything away. And that's what's. The problem with the whole idea of uh, that, that concept of cultural appropriation is that word appropriation because that means it's you are taking something that doesn't belong to you away from someone else. But if I create, you know, a, a minority character, I haven't robbed anyone of anything. I created something out of nothing. It, it, I have not stolen anything. And um, in the same way that. Uh, when you wear the costume of another culture, as long as you paid for it, <laughs> you did not take that away from someone else. And um, it, 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 if, you, if I were to put on a sari, for example, it doesn't mean that people in India can't wear saris anymore. I haven't, I haven't robbed yeah. the sari. But we're not even talking about that, we're talking about your writing about this. Right. Well, even, I mean, it, because as you say, we're talking about words, words that I make up. That's just making more words in the world, and it's, it, it is not depriving anyone of, of anything. Mm. And, um, it, but I, I, I was talking about costumes because, of course, this is a, this has been, uh, it actually, the, the whole concept of a cultural appropriation started out in the fashion industry. Weirdly, yes. um, and because I got into such trouble for actually donning a sombrero for you know the last two words of a, a speech in Brisbane, um, and this was supposed to be some kind of racist outrage. Well, you know what? It was deliberately provocative, though. Of course, it, it was. Um, and it did tie in with the whole introduction of the speech, so it wasn't arbitrary. It was a, a little thematic flourish at the end of the speech. You know, a sombrero is a hat. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing racist about that hat. It's actually, Mexicans do wear sombreros to keep the sun out of their eyes. And, you know, my parents on their first visit to Mexico brought back uh, a sombrero when, uh, in my childhood, and we used to wear, wear it playing. Mm -hmm. It's just, and it wasn't, it's not, it's not racist, it's not even a stereotype, it's just the hat that people happen to wear down there, and let's keep it that way. Yeah. And this whole super sensitivity of, oh, you can't do that, that's some kind of, you know, that's stereotyping, or that's some kind of mimicry, or, you know, I, it's just not the world I want to live in. Yeah. Let's share and share alike, let's <laughs> relax. It's what... Let's play. Mm -hmm. let's, let, let's have fun let, with let's, the stuff out there. Let, let's come back to, to, to literature for a moment and, and the power of words. And you were talking about the links uh, between, uh, between literature and economics there. And I wondered if there's also a, a, a different type of links. If you look at the economy, uh, you've got the virtual economy and the real economy. So the virtual economy is about shares and futures and mm. options and a speculation and so on, and the real economy is the stuff that actually get, gets bought and, and, and sold. And the value of the virtual economy now, again, the shares and the options and so on, is seven times that mm. of the real economy. Wow. So perceived value in economics, because that is really what shares and options and futures and so on mm. are, is more important than reality. And it seems to me that now sort of you've got the same thing in culture where perceived identity, the way people want to perceive themselves is actually more important maybe than what they really are. So people define them, so, uh, themselves exclusively as black or exclusively as women, uh, whatever. Well, that's the most important things in their lives rather than sort of the, the, 
the reality of the complexity of what they are. So have, is there some sort of parallel or analogy there between the perceived value of things in economics and perception in culture, which then at some point, and we seem to have reached that tipping point, one tips over into the other, where then perceived value in culture, say if Penguin says we're going to uh, uh, publish 10 or 20 or 30 percent or whatever it is of minority writers regardless of quality, then they're doing that, yes, maybe to combat social justice, who knows, but also we think because they're thinking that those books might be selling better than the books of white guys over 50. So there, then, that whole identity thing, the whole cultural identity and the whole perception uh, that, we have, that we now have of things actually becomes economically relevant. Do, do you see that kind of link? Does that make sense at all, what I'm saying? Up to a point. <laughs> it was a okay. nice little recitation. Um, I mean, I think the whole um, Penguin Random House uh, diversity strategy announcement was about posturing and perception. So this is part of what you were saying, is that it's a, it is, it's a PR exercise. It is not, but surely also not necessarily motivated by real economics. And well, but if you look at the stuff that gets reviewed nowadays, and mm -hmm. the stuff that gets attention, and the stuff that gets literary prizes, uh, there is more emphasis, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just stating it as a, as a fact, there is more emphasis on minority writers and, 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 and um, uh, gay writers and all the rest of it. So it's not so strange that the publishing house would say, okay, this is going to give us a lot of publicity for a start, mm -hmm. but then also if we go in that direction, because these books are more likely to get reviewed and maybe are more likely to get prizes, it's actually an economically uh, clever way of going. Only if they're good books. And if they are good books, brilliant. And they and then it, they will find a readership. But but you sh surely uh, I, j I just if, I, so, if if a book gets reviewed, it's more likely to be bought. If it doesn't get reviewed, it's nobody more. reads book reviews. Do you think so? <laughs> I write them, so I know. Um, no, I mean. But a book that no one knows about isn't going to get sold, with a few exceptions of stuff that then is on the internet and makes it big. But most, most surely, most books are Publi still dependent publishing on Publishing is public indeed relations. obsessed with diversity right now. And um, there is a certain amount of uh, making up for lost time going on. And it's, uh, there's a degree of uh, compensation. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's generally a good thing. But I would simply stipulate it is a good thing only if you are, you have found writers who are writing really good books that deserve to find an audience and not if it's just a performance, you know, a superficial look at me, um, where we have all these diverse writers uh, and, and the same thing is going on in the prizes uh, when you, you know, you suddenly are discovering whole short lists full of all minorities and a transgender, no, 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 it looks very, you know, carefully balanced. And, and then the reviews also are being given especially to uh, books by minorities. All of this is well and good if the books are good. If the books are not good, if this is just a superficial exercise in virtue signaling, they're not gonna sell. Because what really sells books is word of mouth, book clubs, people saying, look, this is, I loved this book, you've got to read this book. That's what sells books, not reviews, actually, and not even prizes. I mean, if the booker goes to a book that, you know, word is out, it's unreadable, doesn't sell. Isn't that a very naive view, of, uh, naive view of the market, though, when you say, well, the market is really determined by demand and by quality, and it's got basically nothing to do with economics, very little to do with PR, very little to do with whether a book is in the news or not. Surely that's not true. Um, it is true, and that's what's so weird about publishing. You would think, you know, but um, it's hard to sell a book. It's hard to get people to buy a book. And uh, even if you... you, you 
If it were just a matter of a kind of machine and playing a machine, publishers would just churn out the best sellers. You can't do it. it no one knows how to make a best seller. But those are, those are two extremes, aren't they? You're saying it's all about quality and word of mouth. It's not and so other much, I mean, I, say, I don't so mean, I don't, quality in terms of lofty, you know, fine literature, beautifully rendered prose. Something about it has to appeal to the reader, right? And it can be a, a kind of tacky, low-level appeal. I mean, it does, so uh, quality is maybe the wrong word. It, it, it's, it has, when I say good books, I mean that very crudely. A book that people want to read. And there are plenty of books that are not, you know, great books in terms of, you know, what a, a university English department would consider a great book, but still have a, a, an appeal. There's something that people want to read. They, they will pass the time on the train, and that's what they want. So it fulfills an, an appetite for, for a certain kind of literature. And so if you know, this move toward diversity does meet that appetite, then it's brilliant. And it's also commercially savvy, right? So, and I hope that that's the case. But to the degree that, uh, that there's a, a, a that it's uh, cosmetic, if, if decisions are being made solely on the basis of, of ethnicity, say, um, then it's gonna backfire. And, you know, and, that would be bad for literature because, you know, you're in danger of returning to the previous prejudice. Mm -hmm. Lionel, uh, a final question uh, of a more general nature. What do you think literature is for, or to write, to ask the question in a different way? Why do you write? What is it that attracts you to writing? And what is it that you, if anything, you want to get the reader out of your books? I usually start with some... Um, something unresolved for me, something I, I feel conflicted about. That's, that's usually my most fruitful material. Uh, so it's not that I'm, I have this, this clear sense of purpose and strong conviction about something. It's, it's more messed up than that. Um, and, uh, it's sometimes to do with, you know, a social issue, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, my eighth novel is about being torn between two different men, two different kinds of men, which is a very commonplace opposition. So it doesn't, and that was, that's a very good example. It was uh, an expression of uh, uh, being torn in my own life between two men who were very important to me, yeah. and I couldn't have both of them. And doing, I did, did a parallel universe uh, set up so that I looked at a woman's life over the course of about five years, comparing how it works out for her with each of them. And it's not simple, is the point. It's not like, oh, there's the good choice and the bad choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are different circumstances in which one uh, is shown to be more advantageous than the other, and it kind of goes back and forth. So and I, I'm interested in, in that complexity uh, of looking at um, issues, people, places, um, with, with grappling with the difficulty of them. So it's working stuff out and trying to get your head around this, sort of the complexity of life through a fictional setting. Do, do you feel that you or a writer has any sort of social responsibility or do you think I just write my stuff and then it's up to the people what they make of it? Um, I guess you need to take responsibility for what you write and, um, and I do. I'm, uh, I mean Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, <laughs> he had to take responsibility for that. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we publish in a vacuum. But um, 
I don't think that novels in particular have a, uh, an express responsibility to uh, be socially aware or to pursue a particular uh, political agenda. And um, the novels that do don't usually last or make the very impact that they're trying to. Uh, I think it's the books that grapple with deeper issues that are greater than the moment and greater than the political time in which they're written. Those are the ones that make an impact in the present and also are likely to survive into the future. Not very many uh, novels survive, actually, but uh, I, you know, if I'm writing about the U.S. healthcare system. I'm not just writing about, you know, health insurance companies and how much, you know, how unfair they are. But ultimately, if the book's any good, and I think so much for that does succeed in its own terms, I'm writing about mortality. I'm writing about um, what it's like to have to let go of someone you love who's dying. It's a the, ex the experience of living in this mortal coil, which is constantly falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an enduring experience of humanity, and that, that's where the heart of the book is. So if there is a social responsibility at all, it's like it's giving the reader an experience, an experience of that complexity and fragility of life. Is, is, that, is that a good way of putting it? Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good way of putting it in terms of the way I tend to approach my work. Now, most of all, though, I, I, I don't like being prescriptive about fiction. And one of the fun things about the form of the novel, or even the short story, it can, be, uh, it can serve whatever purpose you like. I mean, there, there are no rules. It can be just fun, you know, or goofy. Mm -hmm. or um, whimsical, or really bleak and dark, and offer no, no hope at all to the reader. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's whatever you want. In fact, that's one of the things that's hard about it, is that there are no rules, and nobody quite knows what liter There is no answer to what literature is for. There's only an answer to what a particular book is for, and that's up to you. And that's a wonderful uh, freedom, but it's also a kind of awful freedom. And that's what makes it hard to be uh, a, a freelance fiction writer, is that nobody's telling you what to do. And that's kind of terrible. You know, on certain mornings, when you, you feel you know, a sense of purpose, it's a, it's a lot of fun. But there are other mornings um, where you're a little lost, and you don't know whether this is working. And you know, I go through the composition of whole books of like, oh, you know, and this is a daily experience. I'm a little worried this completely sucks. I'm a little worried that all of this sucks, um, that the whole book is a stupid project and it's not working. And that I have to live with that for, you know, at least a year of that, that anxiety, that lack of confidence. And the funny, f the weird thing for me is that that has accelerated as I've got older when you would have think that it would work the opposite direction. So, um, and I, I guess that's part of what I'm experiencing on a daily basis is that questioning of the purpose of, maybe in, in the big picture, the purpose of literature. Is this a complete waste of time when people just watch TV all day, um, uh, but also the purpose of a particular project. And therefore, that is, that, is, that is the project, actually, in writing a book, is constantly working out what is the purpose of the project. What is this for? Why is this useful to anybody? What are you offering other people? What is on the page that, that other people can avail, avail themselves of that's going to make it better for them that they read that than they didn't read that or didn't choose to read something else. 
And, you know, that's what makes this occupation hard. And, um, but it's also what makes it interesting. So that it's a constant act of self-justification. And um, I actually think that my accelerating lack of confidence is a, uh, probably a, a good sign in terms of my character development um, to only have come to question myself more. Whereas when I was younger, I was filled with a, a sense of self-celebration, which had its own sweetness, you know, uh, that exhilaration in discovering what it's possible to do with words and create something from nothing. And, and, but I think that the, the giving myself a hard time about, you know, is this really worth any, not just my time, but other people's time, you know, there's, yes, I think you should ask yourself that question. There are too many books in the world. In fact, um, I, I, actually, I, I was a big admirer of Philip Roth when he announced mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he, he re was going to retire, and he, he did. Um, he didn't write any more books after he said that. Uh, and I would hope uh, that I have the humility to recognize when I'm just repeating myself or, or writing books that simply don't need to be out there and taking up space that uh, someone else might fill more profitably. I hope I, hope I, I recognize, as Phil Roth did, when it's time to retire. I think that's uh, one way of saying that literature gives us wisdom, and I think that's a very good note to end on. Thank you very much for doing this interview. I enjoyed talking to you. <laughs>